In the steps of the Raj, the Vexil story, a 60-minute lecture illustrated by some 120 slides. Following the defeat of the Spanish Armada, Queen Elizabeth I granted a royal charter to the East India Company in 1600 for the purpose of developing trade in the East. By the end of the 17th century, some 25 trading settlements, which included the presidencies of Madras, Calcutta and Bombay, had been peacefully established. In the 18th and 19th centuries, for a period close on 100 years, the East India Company was the instrument of government in India for the Crown. Crown rule, proclaimed by Queen Victoria in 1858, lasted 89 years and came to an end on the 15th of August in 1947. A brief look at the history that lies behind some of Bexhill's road names will show that there is more to the town than its Delaware Pavilion and Edwardian buildings. In fact, there is more to the town than at first meets the eye. The Lane Memorial in Bexhill, Amherst Road and Willingdon Avenue all tell a story. We will endeavour to cover the Bexhill story as we go along. But first, it would be quite wrong to think that India had no civilization or culture prior to British rule, and certainly unwise to assess the Raj contribution to a history without regard to the achievements and contribution of earlier peoples and empires. A brief look at India's 5,000 years of history would certainly be helpful in putting British achievements in perspective. In the 3rd and the 2nd millennia BC, the Indus Valley civilization, with well planned cities at Mohenjo-daro and Harappa in the northwest of the subcontinent were, was thriving. In, uh, inhabitants there wore cotton garments. They lived in houses of kiln burnt brick with adequate system of drainage and sanitation, whilst early Britons here were living in near Stone Age conditions. The earliest known inhabitants of the subcontinent were called Dravidians. About the year 1500 BC, Aryan nomads, having crossed the Oxus River and the Hindu Kush, made their way down through Afghanistan and, and began to settle in the fertile Gangetic Plain. The Indus Valley civilization by this time had disappeared. The Aryans and the Dravidians intermarried, resulting in a fusion of beliefs as portrayed by the decorative work to be seen on the Dravidian-styled kapurams of Hindu temples found in southern India. Ritualism, however, robbed the religion of its original simplicity, and Gautama Buddha, born in 624 BC at Lumbini, where Nepal frontiers with India, founded in, as a result, Buddhism. We found Arias I crossing the Hindu Kush from Persia into Afghanistan in 518 BC, and then continuing on into the subcontinent to make Sindh and the Punjab into a Persian province. Alexander the Great followed in the year 326 BC. He occupied a country annexed by Darius, but by reason of overstretched lines of communication, lightning campaigns and disaffection of troops so long and so far from home, Alexander decided to withdraw. Many Greeks, however, remained. Those that settled had great influence on the arts and the architecture for centuries as exemplified by Gandhara art and also as seen at the great archaeological site of Taxila, located near Broad Pindi in today's Pakistan. Emperor Ashoka, grandson of Chandragupta, founder of the indigenous Amaryan dynasty, ruled from 274 to 232 BC. He was converted to Buddhism in 262 BC and he sent missionaries to all parts of the then known world. He was renowned for his Ashoka pillars, which carried edicts and the teachings of the Buddha. His empire extended from the Arabian seas to the Bay of Gengol and from the Hindu Kush down to Mysore, almost as extensive as that achieved by the British 2,000 years later. In the first century AD, we see the beginnings of movements of Indian people eastwards founding colonies and furthering both Hindu and Buddhist beliefs in countries which later became Java, Sumatra, 
Malaya, Cambodia, etc. Hindu culture dominated the East to a large degree from the 1st until the 14th century. From the 1st century AD onwards, we begin to see the decline of Greek influence and the rise of the Kushans. They controlled the Silk Route, and their court at Capisa near Kabul rivaled those of the Han in China and the Caesars in Rome. The gigantic statues of Buddha, reaching to heights of 175 feet and to 125 feet, carved into the mountainside of the Hindu Kush at Bamiyan, dated to this period. Sadly, they were destroyed in 2001. We next have the Guptas, who ruled from the 3rd until the 5th, 6th century AD, and this was known as the Golden Age of Indian history. It was a time during which the famous sculptures and cave paintings were being done at Ellora and Ajanta, some 300 miles east of Bombay. Now came the impact of Islam. By the 12th century AD, Muslim influence extended as far east as Bengal. In 1206 we find Qutbuddin as Sultan of Delhi. The 238-foot Qutbinar, Tower of Victory, was erected to celebrate the Muslim ca capture of the city in 1193 AD. In the 13th century, Genghis Khan moved down from Central Asia, bringing devastation as example by the destroyed Shari Soak fort near Bamiyan. Tamerlane followed. He captured and plundered Delhi in 1398. And so we have the Mughals. Their empire immediately preceded that of the British. The legacy of monuments and historic buildings left by them was impressive. Babur was the founder of the great Mughal dynasty. He was born in 1483 near Samarkand. He was a descendant of Genghis and Tamerlane. He crossed the Oxus and the Hindu Kush in 1504, captured Kabul, and which, he, which became his adopted home. Eventually he moved on into the subcontinent and defeated the Delhi Sultan at, in 1526 at Panipat. He died in India. His body, however, was taken back for burial in his favourite Kabul. Humayun, son of Babu, born in Kabul's uh, Balahasar, succeeded his father in 1530. He ruled until 1558. A magnificent mausoleum in Delhi, built by his widow in 1565, with a dome comparable to that of St Paul's, built 100 years later, contains his remains. Akbar the Great, who was a contemporary of Queen Elizabeth I, followed, and he ruled until 1605. He was responsible for the building of the Lahore Fort, and the famous Agra Fort, which with walls 70 feet in height and more than a mile in circumference. He also built a new capital to Fatima Sikri, which later had to be abandoned due to shortage of water. Akbar died in 1605, and buried. His tomb is located at Sikandra, some uh, 10 miles or so from Agra. Akbar's son Jahangir succeeded, and he was responsible for the laying out of the beautiful Kashmir Dal Lakeside Gardens. Shah Jahan, contemporary of Charles I, followed. He ruled until 1658. He was renowned for the Taj Mahal at Agra, built as a mausoleum for his young wife Mumtaz Mahal. It was started in 1630 and it took 22 years to complete. Emperor Shah Jahan was also responsible for the building of the Red Fort and the Jama Masjid in Delhi. And so we come to the last of the great Mughals, Emperor Aurangzeb. He forcibly usurped his father Shah Jahan in 1658 and ruled on until 1707. Aurangzeb was responsible for the construction of the Pearl Mosque inside Delhi's Red Fort and also the Bachai Mosque in Lahore. He was a strict Muslim. He was buried in a simple tomb at Kuldabad in the Deccan. Aurangzeb's death put the East India Company's large investments at risk. For Mughal power, influence and control was at its lowest, lowest ebb. Much had been delegated to local potentates, and now there were several contenders aiming to fill the power vacuum. 
Aurangzeb's death saw the rise of the East India Company as a military and political force by reason of the necessity to protect the British lives and more particularly the large-scale investments of the merchants of Leadenhall Street. The defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588 was a milestone in English history for a number of reasons. Invasion had been prevented and the foundation of siege supremacy had been laid. National pride had been stimulated and London merchants were encouraged to invest capital on a long-term basis. Twelve years after the defeat of the Spanish Armada, Queen Elizabeth was in a position to grant a royal charter to a syndicate of merchants, the East India Company, who had advanced capital for the purpose of developing trade in the East, a risky business without reasonable assurance of supremacy at sea. The trading objective of the East India Company initially was the Spice Islands of Indonesia. The first trading settlement to be found was actually at Bant Bantam in Java. Operations proved, however, to be difficult due to the strong, earlier and well-established presence of the Dutch in that region. The East India Company decided in consequence to establish bases on the Coromandel coast of India, where competition was less. Trading settlements established on the Coromandel coast were initially subject to the authority of Bantam until Madras, established in 1639, became a presidency, with its own governor and, and council directly answerable to the court of directors of the East India Company in London. As a result of peacefully negotiated concessions granted by the Mughal Emperor, his viceroy, or by the local potentate, the East India Company established some 23 trading settlements within the space of 35 years. Profits rarely fell below 100% return on capital, and so the company understandably thought in terms of expansion. The major settlements became the walled forts of Fort St. George in Madras, Bombay Castle and Fort William in Calcutta. They became refugees from attack, famine and disease which were beyond the walls. Bombay was England's first acquisition of territory. It had been granted to Portugal in 1534 by the Sultan of Gujarat. The Portuguese in turn ceded it to England as part of Catherine of Braganza's dowry on the occasion of her marriage in 1661 to Charles II who had been restored to the throne the previous year. Marshland at the time, Bombay was made over to the East India Company by Charles II in 1668 for an annual rent of £10 in gold. In 1687, the Western Presidency of the East India Company was transferred from Surat to Bombay. Throughout the 17th century, trading took place quite peacefully without, without resort to armed conflict. In the 18th century, however, the position changed quite dramatically. On the death of Emperor Aurangzeb in 1707, loyalty to a central Mughal authority began to disintegrate. Local rulers sought to fill the power vacuum. The Mughal viceroy in the Deccan laid claim to Hyderabad, the Marathas took control of central India, and the Sikhs established a kingdom centred on the hall. In 1739, the Persians under Nadir Shah invaded by way of the Khyber Pass. They defeated the Mughal army, plundered Delhi, and made off with the Kohinoor diamond and the peacock throne. The East India Company had rich investments to protect. The disintegration of the Mughal Empire saw the gradual establishment of British rule with the East India Company as the instrument of government. The East India Company was made up of its civil service, writers, and the military, the protective force. Robert Clive was first engaged as a writer, but when the struggle for mastery broke out between the French and the British, he transferred to the company's military arm, which, as subsequent events showed, was more his métier. His defeat of the French deprived them of all political power on the Carnatic coast. By the Treaty of Paris in 1763, French activities were limited to trade. Troops were not to be maintained within their settlements. Clive's defeat of Surajudala in 1757 at the Battle of Plassey opened up the whole of the subcontinent to the East India Company. To crown everything, Clive was granted the Divani, 
by Shah Alam in 1765 at Allahabad, which gave the right to the East India Company to collect taxes in Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. Trade importance as a source of revenue for the East India Company was beginning to recede and revenue was increasingly obtained from the collection of taxes in exchange for the military arm of the company keeping the peace and providing protection to one princely state against attack by another or from outside forces. Parliament, however, was concerned that an English commercial company should secure such power and gradually become the governing body. And so Lord North's 1773 Regulating Act was passed which, whilst establishing the right of the East India Company to administer territory under its control, made clear that such right in emanated from the Crown through Parliament. The position of a five-year term Governor-General was introduced with a Council of Four who had overriding the authority over Madras and Bombay in foreign affair matters. Warren, Warren Hastings, Governor of Bengal at the time, was established as the first Governor-General. General Sir John Clavering, Commander-in-Chief of the Bengal Army, who was married to Lady Diana West, the daughter of the first Earl of Delaware, was a member of Warren Hastings' Council of Four. In the hundred years following Plassey, the East India Company, by alliances, military campaigns, followed by treaties favourable to Britain, gained ever-increasing power. The Khyber had to be watched and defended as the centuries-old route of invasion. The emblems of British regiments remain on the Khyber as recognisable memorials. Canning's 1858 India Act for the Better Government of India passed after the suppression of the Indian Mutiny the previous year required the East India Company to sever its connections with the subcontinent and, as a result, it established direct rule by the Crown with the introduction of the Office of, office of Viceroy, an office additional to that of Governor-General. In the strict sense, this saw the introduction of British Raj rule. It should be remembered that there was, in effect, two Indias, 60% under direct Crown rule and 40% of the country ruled by 565 native princes who had sworn friendship and allegiance to Queen Victoria, who had been proclaimed Queen Empress of India in 1877 on the passing of Disraeli's Royal T Titles Bill. Queen Victoria's 1858 proclamation gave some guarantees that the territories and privileges of the princes would be respected. 118 gun salute states were established which entitled princely rulers to gun salutes ranging by uneven numbers from 9 up to 21. This provided an order of precedence. Maharajas of states entitled to more than nine gun salutes had the honorific prefix of highness. In addition, 117 non-gun salute states were established. Rulers had the entitled, entitlement to be called Raja. There were five princely states entitled to a 21-gun salute. Hyderabad, larger in size than France, Baroda, mentioned again later, Mysore, Gwalior and Kashmir. Udapur, renowned for its idyllic lake palace, was entitled to a 19-gun salute. Jaipur, with its impressive city palace, was in the 17-gun salute category, whilst Kuch Bihar, known to us here in Bexhill, was recognised as a 13-gun salute state. Britain was the first power to achieve paramount rule to cover all India. The task was a mammoth one. Here was a subcontinent almost 20 si times the size of Britain, in fact larger in size than the continental Europe, with a population somewhere in the region of 550 million in, in 1947, at the time of independence, 870 million was the figure given in 1994. It must be over a billion today. With peoples of all colours and opposed creeds, speaking 14 constitutionally recognised languages, covered by some 250 dialects. A workable administration was achieved by the use of English, 
as a unifying overall language and most importantly by the creation of an extensive network of railways which provided ex access to all parts of the great subcontinent. Indeed, it was a mammoth task. India had been a melting pot of cultures for centuries, as hopefully this brief history will have shown. In addition, the British Raj had to contend with environmental extremes, tr a tropical climate, disease, disease which was debilitating and could easily be eternal. As mentioned at the outset, the memory of many who served in India is perpetuated in Bexhill and East Sussex by monuments and roads which bear their name. And so Bexhill and East Sussex Raj connections. Roads, etc., exist in Hastings which perpetuate the memory of Arthur Wellesley. We also have a Wellington place here in Bexhill. Arthur Wellesley saw service in India as a colonel from 1797 to 1804. He fought against Tipu Sultan in the last of the Mysore Wars. On his return to England as a major general, Sir Arthur Wellesley had command of a brigade and his, he and his headquarters was at 54 High Street in Hastings. He is said to have visited Bexhill and would have inspected the King's German Legion, the Hanoverians, who later fought with him at Waterloo. He, he would have undoubtedly visited, visited the King's German Legion at Barrack, at Barrack Hall. An Amherst Road exists in Hastings as well as Bex Hill. William Pitt Amherst succeeded as a second baron to the title of his uncle in 1797. The second Lord Amherst married Sarah Dowager Countess of Plymouth. He, led, he had led an important mission to China as an ambassador in 1816 and is remembered for his refusal to kowtow to the Chinese Emperor. He was Governor General of India from 1823 to 1828. A near mutiny of Indian troops was almost his undoing. He fought the Bur Burmese to protect territory under East India Company's jurisdiction. The war was brought to a conclusion in 1826 by the Treaty of Ayandabu, which ceded Assam and Arakan to the British. Lord Amherst was created an Earl in recognition of his services and took the title Earl Amherst of Arakan. Earl Amherst's first wife died in 1838. The following year he married another dowager Countess of Plymouth, none other than Mary Sackville, the elder daughter of the third Duke of Dorset. She was the widow of his stepson. Mary's sister Elizabeth had married in 1813 George West, 5th Earl Delaware. The two sisters became the co-heiresses of the Sackville estates and so the two marriages can be said to have determined the future history of Bex Hill. Earl Amherst died in 1857, and as Mary predeceased her sister, Elizabeth, the Bex Hill estate as well as Buckhurst passed to the Delawares, who until 1873 took the name Sackville West. A memorial to Elizabeth can be seen in the Sackville Chapel. Amherst Road in Bexhill leads down to Town Hall Square and there we find the Lane Memorial which unveiled on the 25th of June in 1896 in the presence of the 8th Earl Delaware and Lord Brassey perpetuates the memory of Lieutenant Colonel Henry Lane. Henry Lane, son of Henry Snaith Lane of the East India Company's Bengal Civil Service was born in 1827 at Gazapur in India and after schooling in England he returned to India at the age of 16 in 1844 to take up a posting as a cadet with the 5th Bengal Light Cavalry. He served in all the Indian campaigns between 1845 and 1858 as are listed on his memorial in Town Hall Square. As a veteran who saw service during the Indian Mutiny he was 
uh, present at the relief of Lucknow. Having attained the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, he retired at the age of 37 to the family home at Broadoak Manor. The manor no longer exists. After an extraordinary early life, Lieutenant Colonel Lane devoted himself for the next 30 years to the service of Bexhill and its community. He died on the 1st of April in 1895. The following obituary, which appeared on the 5th of April 1895 in the Bexhill Chronicle, tells it all. His never varying amiable and courteous disposition, his suavity of manner and friendly kindness, his genial, frank and manly nature endeared him to everyone he came in contact with. Ever, ever ready to assist in the furtherance of any good object for the welfare of his fellow creatures and the well-being of the parish in which he had spent so many years. His guiding hand so long active, actively engaged in the shaping of the future of the town will be sorely missed for many a day to come. Both Henry Snaith Lane, his father, and Lieutenant Colonel Henry Lane were buried in the cemetery of the Church of St. Mark at Little Common. Charles Richard Sackville West, 6th Earl of Delaware. We made mention of the marriage of Elizabeth Sackville to the 5th Earl of Delaware. Their second son, Charles Richard Sackville West, who was born in 1815, followed a military career. He was commissioned in 1833 as an ensign of the 43rd Foot Regiment and saw service in India. Having attained the rank of captain, he was ADC to General Sir Hugh Gough, later First Viscount, uh, during the First Sikh War. He went on to serve with distinction in the Crimea and attained the rank of Major General. He succeeded as Sixth Earl Delaware in 1869. Sadly, he committed suicide in April 1873. Unmarried, he was succeeded by his younger brother, Reginald Windsor Sackville, who became the 7th Earl of Delaware. Reginald Windsor, with roads named after him here in Bexhill, Reginald Windsor Sackville was born in 1817. He entered the church. He was a rector of Withiam from 1841 to 1865 and chaplain to Queen Victoria from 1846 to 1865. Before, unexpectedly, he found himself succeeding as 7th Earl on the death of his brother. He married the Hon Honourable Constance Cochrane Bailey, sister of the second Lord Lamington. He arranged by royal li license to drop west from the family name. The family name of the early Delawares was West. The Sackville name was introduced on the occasion of the marriage of Elizabeth Sackville to the fifth Earl in 1813. Perhaps a few words about the background history of the Sackvilles. They were of Danish origin, settled in Normandy prior to the 1066 conquest. Herbrand of Salkerville, or Salkerville took his name from the village of Sorkville, located between Dieppe and Longueville. Herbrand features regularly as a forename of the later Sackvilles. For example, the 9th and the 10th Earls, their forename was Herbrand. The Buckhurst estate was acquired by the Sackvilles consequent to the marriage in the early 13th century of a Jordan de Sackville to Ella de Dean, heiress to the, the estate. In 1567, Queen Elizabeth I created Sir Thomas Sackville, first Baron Buckhurst, and granted him in 1570 the Bexhill estate. In 1603, Lord Buckhurst was made first Earl of Dorset by James I. In 1720, the seventh Earl was created first Duke of Dorset by King George I. The seventh Earl of Delaware advanced the development of Bexhill with a view to making it a quality resort which could hold its own with Brighton to the west and Folkestone to the east. With a view to achieving this on Delaware-owned property to the east of the present-day town, he came to a financial come property to the west development agreement with South London builder John Webb. 
Nearly all the seafront hotels were built within the space of 12 years on Delaware property. The Sackville was one of the leading hotels on the south coast in its day. It was an enterprise of the 7th Earl and was opened by him on the 23rd of July in 1890. It was advertised in the Times of India. It attracted distinguished guests, including, it is said, Lord Curzon, who was Viceroy of India from 1899 to 1904. The following extract from the Bexhills Chronicles report of the Sackville's opening um, is enlightening. In fact, it could be taken as discriminating. There's also a restaurant, 20 uh, uh, foot 9 inches by uh, 20 foot 6 inches, with a separate approach from the side road. This restaurant is for use of day visitors of the lower middle classes. In 1897, the 8th Earl Delaware sold the Sackville to the Frederick Hotels chain who owned and managed it for the next 60 years. To many serving in far off parts of the empire, thoughts of the Sackville were synonymous with nostalgia for home. The glory days of the Sackville appeared to fade, however, with the passing of British India. Restrictions, rationing, shortages and of course bomb damage did little to st stimulate interest in the town as a south coast holiday resort after the Second World War. Hotels, instead of being rebuilt, either fell into a sad state of disrepair and were demolished or converted into apartments, as the following shows. The Sackville Hotel opened in 1890, was converted to flats in 1963. Wilton, the Wilton Hotel opened in 1895, was converted to flats in 1970. The Devonshire Hotel, which was, which was built by Webb, was opened in 1886. The hotel part closed in 1957. The Granville Hotel opened in 1905, changed its name to Grand in 1996, and then a couple of years ago, due to uh, arson, is now in a sad state of dilapidation. We wait to know what happens to it. As mentioned, Lord Lamington was the brother-in-law of Reginald Windsor Sackville, the 7th Earl of Delaware, and he was appointed Governor of Queensland from 1895 to 1900, which coincided with Lord Brassey's term as Governor of Victoria in Australia. After Queensland, Lamington was appointed Governor of Bombay from 1903 to 1907. And so to Thomas Brassey, the great railway builder and the father of the first Earl. The great railway builder was born in 1805 near Malpas in Cheshire. He attended Chester Grammar School from 1817 till 1821 and then became article to Mr. Lawton, a land agent and surveyor. In 1826, Lawton took him into partnership. He was persuaded by George Stevenson to become involved in railway construction and he became one of the great contractors of the day, building railways all over the world. It is said by the end of his life he had built one third of those then existing in Britain and one twentieth of those worldwide. In 1831 he married Maria Farrington, who was the second daughter of Joseph Harrison. She provided him with steadfast support and encouragement in all his undertakings. His first undertaking was the construction of the Penkbridge Viaduct in 1834 for the Grand Junction Railway. This was the springboard for the great undertakings which followed. There was the Lancaster to Carlisle link between Lancaster to Edinburgh over Shap Fell, which involved the blasting and removal of 250,000 cubic yards of rock. Then the famous Barentine Viaduct 12 miles outside Ron, the Canadian Grand Trunk Railway, the hazardous construction of the Victoria Bridge over the St. Lawrence River, railways in France, Denmark, Italy, Switzerland, the Argentine, Australia and of course India. The Digsville Viaduct near Wellin stands to this day. He also built the Kahn to Sherberg Railway in 1855 and others too numerous to, to, to go into detail. 
the health-giving benefits associated with Hastings and St. Leonard's, and also his work on the continent, attracted him in, in his later years. He purchased the estate of Sir Peregrine Ackland near Catsfield in 1865, and there built Norman Hurst Court, occupied later by his eldest son. The world-famous railway builder died at the Royal Victoria Hotel in St. Leonard's on Sea on the 8th of December in 1870. He was buried in a simple tomb in the cemetery of the Church of St. Lawrence at Catsfield, adjacent to the West Wall. The impressive memorial window inside the church on the west-facing wall was erected by his eldest son, who in due time was created first Earl Brassey and resided at Normanhurst. Thomas Brassey, the railway uh, contractor, refused invitations to stand for Parliament. His three sons, however, became members of Parliament. His eldest son was created an earl, a granddaughter married an earl, another granddaughter married a duke, and another was married to a viceroy and the Viceroy of India, who was later created a Marquis. A portrait and bust of the railway builder can be seen upstairs in the Durba Hall of the Hastings Museum in St John's Place. Testimonials to his character and achievements are many and glowing. His eldest son, in conveying uh, re uh, recollections to Thomas Brassey's um, uh, biographer, Sir Arthur Helps, writes as follows. In every relation of life, his conduct was marked by the utmost refinement of feeling. He never failed in the consideration of others. And then again goes on, I venture with confidence to affirm that there is not the faintest indication of an ungenerous or unkindly sentiment, not a sentence which is not inspired by the spirit of equity and justice and by universal charity to mankind. And that was from his son. Charles Walker, in Thomas Brassey, the railway builder, writes, at times he employed a hundred thousand men scattered over the face of the earth. He amassed five million pounds, a five million pound fortune by fair means and never limited his, limited his liability. A complete failure would have ruined him. To men like him must go much of the credit for the wonderful reputation British goods and services acquired last century. Charles Walker goes on further and writes, From the lowest ranks, the navvies, Brassey received devotion and loyalty. Yet superficially he did not seem to be the type of man to be so honoured. One can well imagine perhaps the toughest, roughest and least a law-abiding race of working men in the world, devoted to a man who could excel their specialities, who could eat, who could out-eat, out-drink, out-square, out-fight them. But Brassey was a gentleman of the old school. He never swore nor raised his voice unnecessarily and was distressed when, distressed when others did so. Neither was he gluttonous and there was no trace of extramarital relationships. In spite of these handicaps, the navvies followed him faithfully and travelled over five continents in his service. It seemed a paradox that he should have been so idolised and utterly upright representative of Victorian capitalism. It just measures the strength of his personality and leadership, a symbol of paternalism. For him it worked. His men prospered and were happy under it. Well, that covers about one page of the eulogies and the compliments to Thomas Brassey, the railway builder. Actually, that's only one page. In the booklet, it goes on to six. Thomas Brassey's connection with India was an important one. His railway, con his railway undertakings contributed to the creation of that vital network of communications which enabled the British Raj administration to reach all parts of the subcontinent. We move on to his son, his eldest son, Thomas Brassey, who became first Earl Brassey. Thomas Brassey, the railway builder, and Maria Farrington had three sons. A fourth died shortly after birth. 
The eldest son, Thomas, was born at Stafford on the 11th of February in 1836. He was educated at Rugby and University College, Oxford, where he read history and attained an honours degree. He married Anna Almott in 1860 and they lived in Beauport Park, Hastings, until they moved into Normanhurst Court near Catsfield in 1870. They had one son and four daughters. The second daughter, Constance, died in Paris at the age of six from scarlet fever. The marriage of two daughters provided a large connections. Mural Agnes married Gilbert George Sackville, Viscount Cantaloupe, later 8th Earl Delaware, whose uncle was Lord Lamington, Governor of Bombay. Mary Adelaide married Freeman Freeman Thomas, who later became Viceroy of India. Thomas Brassie was MP for Hastings from 1868 to 1885. He was knighted in 1881, raised to the peerage in 1886. Lady Brassie died on the yacht Sunbeam, which had been made famous by her best-selling book, and was buried at sea on the 14th of September in 1887. An impressive memorial was erected to her name in the church of St. Lawrence at Catsfield. Lord Brassey bought Adurba Hall in 1886. It had been part of the India and Colonial Exhibition. It was incorporated as part of Lord Brassey's 24 Park Lane residence in order to house the First Lady Brassey's collection of artefacts from worldwide voyages. Adurba Hall was donated by the second Earl Brassey to the Hastings Corporation. Today it forms part of the Hastings Museum in St. John's Place. Lord Brassey married secondly in 1890 Sybil de Vere, the youngest daughter of Viscount Malden. They had one daughter, Helen. Lord Brassey was appointed Governor of Victoria from 1895 to 1900 and this coincided with Lord Lamington's term as Governor of Queensland. Mr. Freeman Thomas married the youngest daughter of Lord Brassey in 1892. He acted as Lord Brassey's ADC for the period of his governorship of Victoria in Australia. Lord Brassey was Mayor of Bexhill for the year 1907-1908 and in King George V's 1911 coronation honours list he was created an earl. In that same year he opened the Bexhill Colonnade which gives a near mogul look to the seafront promenade. Earl Brassey died on the 23rd of February 1918 and was buried as his father in the cemetery of the Church of St. Lawrence at Catsfield. His grave is located in the cemetery on the opposite side of the road to the church. His son, Thomas Alnett Brassey, the second Earl, was killed in a road accident involving a taxi in London in 1919. He also is buried in the cemetery at Catsfield. And so we find grandfather the great railway builder, the father, the, the first Earl Brassey, and the son, the second Earl, all buried at Catsfield. The demolition of Normanhurst saw the passing of an era of imperialism and paternalism. On the accession of King George V in 1910, Charles Harding and Freeman Freeman Thomas were raised to the peerage. The former took the title of First Baron Harding of Penshurst and the latter First Baron Willingdon of Ratton. The death of Edward VII released Lord Harding from his position as personal advisor of the King on foreign affair matters and provided him with the opportunity to fill, fulfill a long desired ambition who served the crown in India. Lord Harding, at the advanced age of 52, fulfilled his life's ambition and was appointed Viceroy of India. His term of office was from 1910 to 1916. The Vexel connection is provided by the fact that George Edward 
Charles, the third Baron Harding of Penshurst, grandson of the Viceroy, resided in Bexhill and died at the Conquest Hospital on the 13th of July 1997. He was the champion of the ordinary man in the street and on more than one occasion he raised questions in the House of Lords which were of concern to the people of Bexhill and East Sussex. We have mentioned that Freeman Freeman Thomas was raised to the peerage on the accession of King George V. He rose from commoner to viceroy of India, from baron to earl to marquis, within the space of 25 years. A road until recently bore his name in New Delhi, a distinction held by no other viceroy. Freeman Thomas was born at Ratton Manor, it no longer exists. Ratton Manor was located in the attractive village of Willingdon, located at the foot of the South Downs, some two miles north of Eastbourne. He was born on the 12th of September in 1866. The Freeman Thomas family had been lords of the manor since 1750. Freeman Freeman Thomas was educated at the Sheem School, Eton, and went up to Cambridge where he gained his blue. He appeared regularly for the University of Cricket, and his score of 114 against Yorkshire in 1887 was a notable achievement. He married the Honourable Mary Adelaide Brassey in 1892. They had two sons, Gerard, Gerard in, and Inigo. The former was killed in the First World War. Freeman Thomas accompanied his father-in-law, Lord Brassey, to Australia in 1895 and acted as his ADC for the period of his term as Governor of Victoria. On the return of the Brassies from Australia in 1900, Mr Freeman Thomas, following in his father-in-law's footsteps, was elected Liberal MP for Hastings from 1900 to 1906, and then Bodmin from 1906 to 1910. On being raised to the peerage in 1910, Lord Willingdon took the title First Baron Willingdon of Ratton. And now a different interest, Ranji. Ranji was considered the most colourful batsman of his day and made his debut for Sussex in 1895. He appeared for the county for some 12 non-secretive seasons and captained the county from 1899 to 1903. He scored a total of 18,594 runs in first-class cricket. It should be mentioned that he lost the sight of his right eye in a shoot accident on the Yorkshire Moors in 1915. In August 1896, Ranji played in Bex Hill. It was the same year that the Australians played here. He appeared for a Sussex 11 at Lord Cantu's ground against an Earl Delaware's 11, which included Surrey's fast bowler Lockwood. Lockwood caused havoc, bowling at his customary pace without regard for a below standard pitch. Ranji, however, treated him with complete disdain, scoring 40 of the Sussex teams a meagre total of 71 runs. Ranji appeared at the Hastings Priory Meadow Ground in 1902 when the county scored their record of 705 runs for eight wickets declared against Surrey. On this occasion Ranji scored 234. The Hastings, uh, the Hastings Ground no longer exists. It made way for the Priory Meadow Shopping Precinct, which was opened by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on the 6th of June in 1997. Ranji succeeded to the title of Jam Sahib of Nawanaga in 1907, and from that date he was the ruler of a native princely state of 3,791 square miles, which entitled him to a 13-gun salute. He was elected president of the Sussex County Cricket Club for the year 1930, and in that office saw his nephew, the famous Adulip Sinji, 
score his record of 333 runs in one day at the home ground against North Ants. And so to the Bexhill Maharajas. Maharaja Niprenda Narayan of Kuch Bihar. He was an, an honorary ADC to Edward VII and was born on the 4th of October in 1862, succeeding his father the following year and formally installed as Maharaja on reaching his majority in 1879. Kuchbaha was an Indian princely state of some 1,300 square miles with a population in the region of 600,000 people. It was located in northeast, northeast India, north of Bengal and Bangladesh and south-southeast of Bhutan and Assam. Its order of precedence as a native princely state was established by its entitlement to a 13-gun salute. The Maharaja's residence was the Kuch Bihar Palace, which was designed by an English architect built about 1870 on the outskirts of the town of Kuch Bihar. Gaitri Devi, Rajmata of Jaipur, and a granddaughter of Maharaja Nuprenda Narayan of Kuch Bihar, tells us in her memoirs that the staff of the Kuch Bihar Palace numbered between 400 and 500 people, that there were two, 20 gardeners, 20 stable hands, 12 working in the garages and possibly a hundred in the elephant compound. It should be remembered that Kuch Bihar was tiger country. There was a professional tennis coach and ball boys, ten sweepers for the driveways and paths, five or six ADCs looked after the various departments of the household. Each of the princesses, three of them, had a personal maid in addition to governesses. There was a state band of 40 musicians who played every night before dinner, as well as on ceremonial occasions. Maharaja Naprenda Narayan of Kuch Bihar married in 1878 Suniti Devi, the eldest daughter of the reformer Keshav Chand Sen. He held the beliefs of Brahmo Samaj, Unitarian in doctrine, which, was, which had been founded by Raja Ram Mohan Roy. Maharaja Niprenda Narayan and Maharani Suniti Devi had four sons and three daughters. One or more of the daughters attended Queenwood School in Eastbourne with Princess Indira of Baroda. The Maharaja and Maharani were frequent visitors to England. On the occasion of their visit for Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee in 1887, Sunisi Devi was admitted to the Order of the Crown of India. The Maharaja saw service in the Frontier War and volunteered for service in the South African War. He received the Order of the Bath for services in the Tirar. On the occasion of King Edward VII's coronation, His Highness Maharaja Niprenda and his family leased Moor Hall at Ninfield. The building no longer exists. It was demolished in 1998 to, to be replaced by a modern complex of five or six houses. Maharaja Niprenda arrived in good time for King George V's coronation, which took place on the 22nd of June in 1911. The Maharaja's health had been poor for some two years previously, and on doctor's advice, he had leased 22 Marina Court Avenue, so that he might have the benefit of Bexhill Sea Air. He died sadly, however, on the evening of Monday the 18th of September, in 1911 at the age of 48 years. Maharaja Kumar Rajendra Narayan, the successor, son and successor, headed the mourners. He was followed by his three brothers, line of breasts, and they came, and then came the late Maharaja's other relatives and staff. The Cordes proceeded up Devonshire Road into Station Square, the coffin was taken by train to London, Victoria, from where it was transported on a Union, on an Union Jack draped gun carriage with full military honours to Golders Green Crematorium. 
the funeral services was according to the Brahmo Samaj rite. The Bixville Charter Trustees hold a 20 carat gold memorial plate which was donated uh, to uh, the to Bexhill, then a borough at the time. The reign of Rajendra, the successor, was short in dur dur duration. Prince Rajendra had apparently been refused permission by his family to marry earlier. The person of his choice, Edna May, a leading popular light musical artist of the day. It is said he took to drink he died at Cromer on the 1st of September in 1913. And so it was that Jitendra, the second son, succeeded. Jitendra was born on the 20th of December in 1886. He had been educated at Eton and the Imperial Cadet Corps Academy. With some furor, he had eloped and married in London Princess Indira, the daughter of His Highness Maharaja Gekwa of Baroda. Princess Indira had attended Queenwood School in Eastbourne with the daughters of the Maharaja Nuprenda Narayan of Kuch Bihar. The Maharaja returned to Bexhill in 1913 to open a memorial drinking fountain erected to the memory of his father. It was erected where the Delaware Pavilion was subsequently built. On a visit to Sussex in 1922, Maharaja Niprenda fell ill and developed pneumonia. He died in London on his birthday on the 20th of December in 1922 at the age of 36. Princess Jagadrupenda, the eldest son of Jichendra, succeeded at the age of seven years and so the Dowager Maharani acted as regent until he came of age. Maharaja Jagadrupenda was educated at St. Cyprian School in Eastbourne and then Harrow and Trinity Hall, Cambridge. He married an English girl and died without issue on the 11th of April in 1970. Princess Ela, the eldest daughter, was born in Calcutta in 1914 and she was educated at Ravenscroft School in Eastbourne. Princess Menaka, the youngest daughter, was born in 1920. She and Gaitri Davy are surviving sisters with memories of their grandmother, Suniti Davy. Princess Gaitri Davy, the second daughter of Maharaja Jitendra, was born in London on the 23rd of May in 1919. Her mother, Maharani Indira, daughter of, of the Maharaja Gekwa of Baroda, died in Bombay, aged 76, on the 12th of September in 1968. Princess Gaitri Devi married His Highness Maharaja Sawaman Singh of Jaipur on the 9th of May in 1940 as wife number three. Wives number one and two were princesses of the neighboring princely state of Jodhpur. The Maharani Maharani Gaitri Devi, her marital home, became the Rheinberg Palace, today one of India's leading hotels. The princely state of Jaipur had connections with the Mughal Emperor Akbar. Raja Bamal gave his daughter in marriage to Akbar. Their son, Jahangir, succeeded as emperor on the death of his father. Jaipur city was founded in 1728 by Maharaja Jai Singh II. Prior thereto, the capital had been at Amber, some five miles away, renowned for its fortress palace, which was commenced in the early 17th century. Maharani Gaitri Devi was a hostess of international renown. Guests entertained at the city palace have included Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, the Mountbattens, Eleanor Roosevelt, Jacqueline Kennedy, Bulganin, Khrushchev, etc. Her, her husband, the Maharaja of Jaipur, a world-renowned polo player, was appointed ambassador to Spain in 1964. Following a fall at Polo, the Maharaja died at Sirencester on the 24th of June in 1970. 
His body was flown back to India and lay in state in the, on the 26th of June in the impressive Chandra Mahal of the city palace prior to cremation the following day. And so we conclude with details of the career of one of the last of the British Raj to give service to the Crown in India, Freeman Freeman Thomas. As already mentioned, he was raised to the peerage in 1910. He was Governor of Bombay from 1913 to 1919. Reminders of his term of office there exist to this day. There's the Gateway of India, which was erected to commemorate the visit of King George V and Queen Mary on, for the coronation uh, Delhi Durba in 1911. And then there's the Willingdon Club, which he founded. He's shown on the impressive list in the se Secretary's office as the club's first president. He was next appointed Governor of Madras, the term of office being from 1919 to 1924. Willingdon Island in the harbour area of Cochin carries his name. In 1924 he was created a Viscount and in, and in that year was a delegate at the Assembly of the League of Nations. From 1926 until 1931 he was Governor General of Canada. Now the high point of his career, in 1931 he was created an Earl and was appointed Viceroy and Governor General of India. He had a new capital, New Delhi, the work of Sir Edwin Lancia Lutchins and Sir Herbert G Baker, with the, which provided a ceremonial way, the Rajpath, more than a mile in length, which ran from India Gate, the war memorial commemorating 70,000 soldiers killed in the First World War, which ran up Racina Hill to the Presidential Palace, formerly the Viceroy's residence. This was part of the Raj legacy which was left when British, when British rule came to an end some 16 years later. It serves as a fitting processional way for India's Republic Day Parade which takes place annually on the 26th of January. Lord Willingdon's term as Viceroy last, lasted from 1931 to 1936. Reminders of his lengthy period of service to the Crown in India exist in Bexhill, Hastings and Eastbourne, as well as New Delhi. A Willingdon Avenue is to be seen in Bexhill, a Willingdon Road exists in Hastings, and not only do we have a Willingdon Road in Eastbourne, but in its town hall at the top of the impressive staircase we find the plaster cast used for the life-size statue of Lord Willingdon, which at one time fronted the Viceregal Palace in Delhi. Brassey Avenue, near adjacent to the Anglican Cathedral in Delhi, is a mark of rare and limited distinction. It perpetuates not only the memory of the maiden name of the one-time Viceregal, but also that of her grandfather, who importantly contributed to the construction of India's much-needed system of railways. On the conclusion of his term as Viceroy in 1936, Earl Willingdon was created a Marquis and made Lord Warden of the Cinque Ports. He died in 1941 at the age of 74. Six years later, the sun did finally set on the British Indian Empire, for on the 15th of August in 1947, India attained her independence. The Dowager Marchioness, Mary Adelaide Brassey, lived on some 20 years and died on the 30th of January in 1960. The remains of both Marquis and Marchioness Willington are interred in the nave of Westminster Abbey. And so a long story, I hope not too many dates, I hope you found it interesting. Thank you for listening.